people are using that as an argument. You did not eat a well-formulated vegan diet, blah, 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 blah. So here's a couple things I wanna to do to address that before we jump into the blood work so y'all can shut the hell up. Welcome back for part two of the vegan experiment. So today I wanna to touch on some things. I wanna uh, recap some things. It's funny, I've been uh, seeing some comments that I wanna address. And two, I wanna recap things. We have all the blood work here. We have sperm analysis here. We have body composition analysis. And I'll explain to you a little bit what's going on with the gut. So first and foremost, I wanna explain a couple things. I wanna recap on the body composition data because the entire last video, I wanted you guys to see an overview of the experiment. That's why it was really long. But the real take home was what happened to my body composition. So I literally printed out my entire body composition for you to go over. And so here's what it is, right? And I wanted to, I've dexa a lot. And so I know how to DEXA. Um, how we know how to take those measurements. And so I wanted to compare it to like the last, the earliest I dexed it in 2019 was in February. So February of 2019, all the way to January of 2020, which is when I ended the experiment. So if you just look at from pre to post of the experiment, the key takeaways are this. My body fat went from before 15 to after 15.9, right? This is the most alarming part, right? And this is where everyone's freaking out. And there is some reason to be concerned because this is pretty substantial. My lean body mass went from 70.02 kilograms to 66.76 kilograms. So again, 70.02 to start after the experiment, after, after a month of being vegan, 66.76. I lost nearly four kilos um, of lean body mass. Now what happened to my fat mass? My fat mass prior to was 12.88 kilos. Afterwards, it was 13.14, right? A, ch a small change, but one that definitely didn't go in the right direction. So hence why I gained about a percentage of body fat. Now the thing I wanted, the reason why I took other measurements, cause I wanted to compare this, is if you look at my lean body mass, my lean body mass is pretty similar uh, across the board. So in February of 2019, um, literally a year ago, my lean body mass was 68.88 kilograms, 68.88. Then uh, over the course of the year, at the end of 2019, when I did my pre-measurements, I was up to about 70.02 kilograms. So I gained over the course of the year, I gained about a kilogram of lean body mass. Now, over the course of a month of being vegan and not properly supplementing, and I'll explain my thoughts on this so you guys don't think it's just dry skeletal muscle mass, I lost about four kilograms in a month, likely from being deficient in protein. And here's the key takeaway of that. One, it's super alarming because I'm not only, after this month, I'm not only at 66 kilos, I'm worse than I was a year ago at 68 kilos. Now, again, is all of that dry skeletal muscle mass? Probably not. Is there some uh, water that's part of that? Based on the in-body, it wasn't much, if any. Um, and the fact of the matter is I was eating more carbs than I ever had in the entire month. So no one would ever say it's due to a depletion of carbohydrates because the entire 2019, I was super low carb and mostly ketogenic throughout the entire year. Uh, whereas that entire month I had carbs. So you wouldn't expect any changes in the negative for glycogen replenishment. Hence why I don't think a lot of it is water, but there could be. Four kilograms is a lot to lose in a month. Um, but that's the take home of the body composition data, period. I lost muscle, I gained a little bit of fat. Is it alarming? Yes. Um, and so I put that out and of course, the first thing I get, and you're gonna get this with any time you do an experiment. Oh, of course you lost muscle mass. You ate like shit. All you ate was processed foods because what I wanted to do was in the video, if you go back to the video number one, is I, I broke down what some of the meat alternatives are. 
if you want to ask anyone on my team, including the the guy, the research team at Aspie, half of those things, probably three quarters of those things, I did not eat, and I actually brought for them to try. And so we cooked them up for them to try, and I did not eat them throughout the experiment. The only reason I bought them was to do a demonstration to show what some of the caveats and some of the negative side effects are of, of eating processed foods uh, and meat alternatives that are filled with vegetable oils, period. So here's something I wanna do, right? Um, people are using that as an argument. You did not eat a well-formulated vegan diet, blah, 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 blah. So here's a couple things I wanna do to address that before we jump into the blood work so y'all can shut the hell up, right? Uh, first and foremost, here's the, here's the thing I wanna talk about. One, if all I ate was processed foods, would everyone here that's watching this agree? If I ate the Beyond Meat and I ate all of those meat alternatives filled with vegetable oils and everything, would everyone here agree that my blood work would likely be bad? I'll wait. Okay, we're all in agreement, right? If, I, if that's all I ate, I would likely be bad. Hell, I'm wearing a ketogenic.com shirt, watch. Everyone always goes, oh, well, you're keto. Fun fact, you can be vegan and keto. I have friends that have written books on vegan and keto. Fun fact, I was not keto prior to the experiment during December for that sole reason, and I was not keto during the experiment. I was low carb, so let's negate that off table. But let's use this example. If I'm eating a ketogenic diet and I eat fat bombs, every single day for every single one of my meals and all I eat are processed junk, prepackaged foods, and I do not eat one ounce of whole foods, would we agree that my blood work would like to be terrible? I'll wait. Yes, right? Okay, we're all in agreement on that. Let's use, let's use the final example, right? Because we like to think of extremes, right? Vegan, like an omnivorous diet. Let's go to carnivore, right? The tabooed carnivore. If all we ate were Big Macs without the bun on our carnivore diet, would we all likely agree that there would be some negative effects of our blood work and likely body composition and, and overall profiles due to just eating processed junk if that's the only thing that we ate? Would we all come to that agreement? Even the carnivores that are watching this video, would we agree that if all we ate were Big Macs without the bun for every meal for an entire month, we would have negative effects on our blood work? I'll let you write that one down because that one might be a little bit more challenging. Yes, right? We would all agree. We would all agree that if all we ate was processed junk, it would have a negative effect on our blood work. So before I go into the blood work, I want to touch on something and I want to show you guys some of my meals because y'all are like, oh, all that, that's all you ate. Here are some of my meals, salads, right? With nuts and seeds represented a majority of my diet. I had legumes. Um, I had a ton of avocados. Like that was the large majority of my meals. And so people ask for my macros. Let's post those. Showing you I wasn't on a ketogenic diet. I was eating um, 50 to 60% fat. I was having a fair amount of carbohydrates and I was having a fair amount of protein. I was eating about 125 grams of protein if I remember correctly. Um, and which is what I was eating all throughout December as well. So again, that can negate the entire conversation of your diet was just shit, so this experiment was shit, right? If I wanted to do a shit experiment, I, we, can, we can figure that out and we can run that different. If, all you, if you guys want me to do another experiment where all I eat is a Beyond Burger every day versus a Big Mac every day, that would suck, but I'd be interested in doing it. I would do it for the sake of science so that way we can get over this whole issue about what the composition of the diet was. So now that, that uh, that's over, let's go into the blood work, right? Because I know the vegans and people who are plant-based are super quick to jump in and attack. And I understand you're coming from a sense of like, you wanna protect your culture and whatever you have going on, but let's not be so quick to judge because the blood results are actually more positive than you would imagine. Um, and clearly an indication that all I, all I ate wasn't Beyond Burgers and processed meat. So. We have the side-by-side, -side. Quest Diagnostics, month apart, literally same exact on both. So let's go through them. I'll go through line by line so you guys have no questions whatsoever. High, sensi high sensitivity CRP. Um, this is before. Before 0.4, 
afterwards 0.3. So no changes in one of the most one of the most prominent markers of inflammation, right? 0.4 down to 0.3. No significant change, but if all I was eating was pro was things filled with vegetable oil, likely that would have been driven through the roof, indicating I was not. So that's one huge win for this vegan experiment is that inflammation did not go up or a marker of inflammation did not go up. Now let's go to our lipids, right? Because I know this was a huge part of the game changers. Let's look at the vial. Let's do the, all these things. And I want to really, really address this because um, on paper, if I were to bring these labs to a doctor, they would say, what the hell did you do to improve this? I could likely take you off a of statin if this were the case. I'm not on a statin, but if someone were to look at my pre numbers and see my total cholesterol was at 254, if I were to walk in without a doctor knowing me, they would likely hand me a statin, right? Because if you look at high is considered anything over 200. My pre was at 254. Afterwards, I was at 142. So my total cholesterol went from 254 to 142. I'll get into what I think on that, but I want to make sure I give you all the numbers. HDL, 71 to 65, right? Started at 71, went to 65, right? No significant change, which is good. Um, good HDL uh, on both. Anything over 40 is good. So triglycerides uh, went from 39 to 50, right? 39 to 50. So no significant changes in triglycerides. Um, LDL cholesterol went from 175 before down to 60, right? So on those two things alone, if you're on, and I'm gonna say the vegan camp, you would say, look at, I told you this is crazy. Look at the improvements in cholesterol, um, which is important. I do think that uh, managing lipids is important. Now, do I think cholesterol is the most important lipid? Absolutely not. I think there are way other and more important markers, hemoglobin A1C, C, VLDL size, all of these things, um, which we'll jump into. But nonetheless, someone could look at this and make the argument, the lipids improved, um, and I'll put improved in quotations, and here's why, is they went from 254 down to 142 on total cholesterol, 175 down to 60 on LDL cholesterol. Now, someone would make the argument, you were at risk for uh, arthrosclerosis, um, you were at risk for coronary artery disease, um, everything, right? Uh, before, now you wouldn't be afterwards. I wanna show you a very, very important paper. So here's a paper that my friend, Dr. David Diamond, was an author on. LDL cholesterol does not cause cardiovascular disease. Um, and this is a comprehensive review of the literature. They did an incredible job breaking this down. And if you look at this, I highly recommend you read this study and check it out, showing there's no causality of high LDL cholesterol to cardiovascular disease, despite what your doctor may tell you. Um, now there is a relationship between like high triglycerides, high markers of inflammation, high markers of hemoglobin A1C and cardiovascular disease in combination. LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol by itself, no causality. Yes, there's correlational data, but correlational data in this instance means very little. Why? Here's why. Here's another study that they cite from this study titled Association of Lipoprotein Levels with Mortality in Subjects Age 50 Plus Without Previous Diabetes or Cardiovascular Disease, a Population-Based Register Study. And what they conclude in this study, all-cause mortality was lower in the groups with total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol above the recommended levels, meaning that people who had higher LDL and higher cholesterol levels lived longer. Yes, I say that again. People who had higher cholesterol levels lived longer. So you can make the argument to the counter, and I'm not gonna stand and, and sit here and go, oh, well, I was healthier here than here. Listen, at the end of the day, you can't make the argument that total cholesterol, uh, high total cholesterol and high LDL cholesterol is a negative marker by its own, on its, by, its own right? um, by itself. There's other factors you need to keep in mind. You can make the argument that, hell, 
high amounts of cholesterol, high amounts of LDL cholesterol might actually be more advantageous for longevity, right? Cholesterol is important. Without context of other things, and one of the reasons why I suggest you need to get an NMR, you can't just look at total lipids, is very, very important. Here's the biggest changes in uh, my NMR, and here's why I did an NMR on both. So before, you look at LDL particles, mine was through the roof on when I was uh, eating a mix of a plant and meat-based diet. 1787, afterwards it's 789, right? Huge changes, right? My HDL particle went from 38.6 down to 32.1, right? HDL is very, very important. There's strong data on HDL, and my HDL particle went down. Um, VLDL size, we talk about very low density lipoprotein size. One of the primary markers of getting lodged inside of our blood vessels and getting lodged to potentially create plaques and lead to some of the complications that lead to cardiovascular disease. Before was at 41.4, afterwards was at 47.8. So it went from optimal, which is the green, to moderate, which is the yellow, right? So VLD, though your typical lipids might have improved, VLDL got worse, um, which is a, a way better marker. Now I'll run through some of the rest of these because uh, there really wasn't that many changes. Um, glucose went from 97 uh, to 90, no significant changes there. Insulin um, stayed the same. Hemoglobin A1C, 5 before, 5.2 after. No significant change in hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of insulin sensitivity, which is really good. Um, omega check, my uh, omega-3 fatty acids went from 4.6, which is moderate, down to 3.7, um, which is high risk. So that's definitely not the best. Um, Obviously, I wasn't having fish oil. I was using like an algae omega-3 as a supplement because I went. I wanted to make sure I was supplementing the same things I was supplementing before and after. So um, that was definitely something that just to be concerned of. You need to supplement with omega-3 fatty acids. Obviously, you can't use fish oil if you're vegan. You need to supplement with other sources or really try and dial in some form of vegan-based food options that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. My omega-3 total before was 4.6, afterwards was 3.7. Uh, omega-6 before was 42.7, afterwards was 45.5. So um, no significant, I wouldn't consider that significant. Uh, the omega-3 is significant. The omega-6, there wasn't anything. And again, if all I was eating was crap, meatless stuff, I guarantee you my omega-6 profiles would have been a lot higher on the vegan-based approach. It would be a lot higher if even on an on a omnivorous approach, all I was eating was junk vegetable oil-based foods, right? So again, I, just, I don't want to harp on the, the concept of this, like, the diet itself was to the best extent as well formulated low carb as you're gonna get. Now here's some things, you look at um, estradiol. My estradiol was less than five um, before, so that's good, 14 after. Um, so the average range is 27 to 52. So both of them are really low, it went up, from less than five to 14, bef less than five before, up to 14 after. But again, nothing that would be too alarming that I would be worried about, for me at least. Uh, follicle stimulating hormone, no changes. Luteinizing hormone, no changes, five to 5.9. Testosterone, I know that was a big concern. Oh, I didn't even realize. So testosterone went from 613 before and this is total testosterone, 613 before down to 531. So I dropped about 82 points, if my math is right, 82 points on testosterone, um, which isn't significant to be concerned. It's, it's enough that it would probably cause an issue for some people. Testosterone free 
went from 12.26 down to 8.97. Um, so I did drop a little bit there. Uh, testosterone bioavailable, they do a calculation, I guess. 313 down to 248. T4 free went from 1.3 to 1.5, no changes really. Um, nothing really changed. Ferritin, um, which is interesting. So this is something I don't understand. I mean, I guess it's a small change. So the range for ferritin, uh, which is a marker of uh, anemia slash iron metabolism, is from 18 to 300. Went from 22 before up to 44 after. But again, when the range is 18 to 300, it doesn't really mean much. Um, no changes in white blood cell, red blood cell count, all of that. Uh, I printed this twice by accident. No changes in that. So that's your blood data, right? Um, again, like I have no problem going over each one of these. That's the blood data, right? So again, main takeaways on blood. Uh, total, if you look at it, if you just did a lipid panel, uh, you would say, oh, when it went down significantly, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. One, based on these studies, can make the argument that that's not necessarily a good thing. I'm sitting here saying it's not necessarily uh, a bad thing. It's not, it may not necessarily be a good thing. That's what I'm saying, without proper context of everything else. Hemoglobin A1C didn't change, which is good. High, sensitive, high sensitivity CRP didn't change, which is good. Um, VLDL size went up, which is not good. Uh, testosterone went down slightly. Omegas went down slightly. Um, no real changes in estradiol. Estradiol went up slightly, but no significant changes, right? And I think those are the main takeaways. So before I get ripped apart by the vegan camp, there's your blood data showing it's not as bad as most people think as long as you have a well-structured routine. Now, the question what I would have is what would happen if I were to carry that out for six months, right? That's a, that's a whole nother animal. Would I continue that trend? Would testosterone continue going down? Would estradiol continue going up? Would my omegas continue to suffer? Um, would my VLDL size continue to go up? Yes, my cholesterol might improve, but um, what does that really mean in the grand scheme of things, right? Right? Uh, so that's that's just something to keep in mind and consider. But overall, I was more impressed that um, high, sensitivity, high sensitivity CRP didn't change um, and other markers that I thought might have had a bigger fluctuation didn't change as much as I thought they would. So that's good, right? When you could classify that as a win for the vegan community on blood work. The last two things I want to talk about um, before I sign off and let you guys chat in the comments about what your thoughts are on the blood work is I also did a sperm analysis. So here's something I wanted to do this just to see what would happen. Um, I did not do a pre, so that's a problem. Obviously in science, you can't really make any conclusions, but I wanted to show you the data anyway. I used, a, I have a video on a company called Daddy, D-A-D-I, where I did it. The problem with them, and the reason why I didn't use that same company again, is they don't just do analysis. They do storage, right? They do storage and they give you an analysis. I didn't want to pay for another round of storage and analysis. I just wanted the damn analysis. And so this company called Legacy did the analysis for me. So afterwards, after 30 days, and I might have done it to prematurely in a sense that based on everything I've read, it takes about 45 days for your sperm to turn over to have a significant impact, but I wanted to do it anyway um, just to see if there was any impact that happened after a month, right? Sperm concentration in the normal range, volume in the normal range, total count within the normal range, uh, motile sperm in the normal range. Um, and the, before I go further, the reason why I'm not comparing this to my daddy is the values are different. Their, their values are in um, per, per milliliter, whereas that one is in millions of, of arbitrary units. So it wouldn't be a fair comparison. Um, percent abnormal is below normal range. Uh, what that means is abnormal sperm, a sperm morphology uh, can be for a number of reasons crooked tail or crooked head, 
it, ability, it impacts the sperm's ability to penetrate the egg. Um, if you look at total motility, it was below the normal range. Um, you look at progressive motility, it was below the normal range. Velocity, I didn't even know that they can measure that, um, was within the normal range and all the rest of the stuff. Linearity was in the normal range. So the only area of concern for me um, is total motility, progressive motility, basically the ability of sperm to move efficiently. Now, will I sit here and say that the vegan diet affected that and it's gonna destroy your sperm motility? No. Will I say it's something interesting and worthwhile looking into? For sure. Um, and so I wanted to do that just as an area of like, hey, here's some further things that you can ponder on if you wanna test this on yourself, you're doing an experiment on yourself, if you've been vegan for a long time, test it on yourself, if you've been carnivore for a long time, if you've been eating an omnivorous diet and you are plant and meat based, try it, right? Test it out. And then the last thing I wanna to touch on because I don't wanna keep make this video as long as the other one is, um, I want to touch on my microbiome. I know you like, I want to be super, super transparent with you guys. So you could see Viome takes forever. It's one of the reasons why I freaking wanted to do you biome. I think Viome is great, but like, it's just a long process. So they received it in early February and they're still processing it. Um, which stinks. So I guess that just means we'll have to do a round three. When Viome is done and I'm able to sit down and analyze the gut microbiome results, I'll come back, show you guys what they found and as compared to the test that I did um, in February of last year. That's the last time I did a Viome, was February, literally February of 2019. So even though it won't be a pre-post test, at least we have something to compare it to. So, that's it. I wanted to just jump on, explain to you blood data, be super transparent and honest with you guys. So blood, summarize this all, lost lean mass, gained a little bit of fat mass. Blood, no real significant changes. You can make the argument that a huge significant change was in the lipid profile, um, in that my total cholesterol went down significantly, my LDL cholesterol went down significantly. The impact of that is up for debate. Um, VLDL size went up. Uh, testosterone went down, estradiol went up, omegas went down. Um, that's the main takeaway. Sperm motility is just something interesting. Who knows the impact that the diet had on it, but it was just something interesting that I took, I tested, so why not present it? So that's, that's it. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let me, let me know anyone that's had similar, different results. If these results surprised you, let me know. If they didn't surprise you, let me know. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. Appreciate y'all. As always, make positivity louder. Love you.